All right. So some people may wander in. We'll see. All right. So I guess that's enough schedule. Um, and let me take a look at the news. So this is uh, Zuckerberg. Uh, Irvin's making a big deal out of that. Zuckerberg has put out an op-ed uh, asking for more government regulation of speech on the internet, which about, although it seemed logical enough to me. Um, he has exactly the same problem as everybody else has with internet security and privacy. If the rules aren't clear, nobody knows what to do, and you're guessing. And so uh, it is logical. I, I, I understand why he wants to do it. A lot of, um, if they if you just make up their mind what the rules are, then he could follow the rules. Right now, whatever he does, everybody hates him. So this is the same thing people say about uh, tax laws and all sorts of things. Um, so I don't know if it's going to happen, though, because the, uh, the U.S. government has been absolutely paralyzed for more than 10 years on cybersecurity. They've tried and tried to pass laws, and they can't agree at all what the laws should be. The Even, well, yes, but on this issue especially, um, there's been many, many people that want to have a data sharing law like they have in Europe, so that if you get hacked, you're allowed to tell other companies what happened so they can protect themselves. But in order for that to happen, you have to be protected from lawsuits because when you tell them anything, you're going to have to send them data, and that might include some data about your customers. So the, uh, they've been unable to break that logjam at all. And another thing they've tried to do over and over is require some kind of licensing for security professionals and some kind of security standards for websites and companies, but they can't reach any agreement on what those would be. De facto, the licensing for professionals, the CISSP, but the government has not put its weight behind that, and many people argue that's not the right thing to do. You know, I'm afraid this is uh, the general wisdom about the internet and cybersecurity is it's probably better for the government to just stay out of it because it just changes too fast for the government's process to do any good. But it takes them 10 or 20 years to pass it on, and you're stuck with it for 30 years, and so everything you get would be totally out of date. But anyway, that's where we're at. Um, so, I heard an interview with Huawei, um, which was very interesting, you know, claiming that they had the best 5G kit and many other countries are using them and America should just shut up and accept it. Do uh, you know something else about them? They, uh, they seem to be uh, open their source code to the, uh, the British spy and the British spy did a, um, did a uh, report on it and saying that uh, because Huawei was um, licensing uh, open software, yeah, uh, and then uh, every every time the open source software the new version come out, it put all the features. So while we was going in, go forward, and then uh, pick up the older version, and then you know bring the feature back. And uh, for this part, we're saying that uh, that process of bringing and bringing the malware code, malware code, you know. Wait, so where is the malware coming from? Because it is while we was taking up the older version of the open source software. So Huawei is taking the old open source stuff. Because the new version, they, they break all the, all the features. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, that's usually the group. So, so, so the British part was saying that process was, was kind of faulty because they kept bringing the you know, bad code into the new operating system. It was, it was kind of like that. But what they couldn't do, right? They want, you know, they want to, they can, they can, you know, have a you know, big software you know, team to, to do all the software, and so they have to buy some, you know, buy some open software to do it cheap. So, you know, yeah. Well, I mean, they could do something, but that's, I think, the same thing everybody says. It's much easier to use old stuff that has the features you need that you've already built, and going to new stuff means doing a whole bunch of work, yeah. re-engineering stuff. And um, so I, I don't know if Huawei's any different than any other company in that regard. That's expensive, and they're trying to avoid it. Everybody is doing the same thing. Yeah. That's the only thing that depends on the cost. Yeah. Well, of course, so the U.S. Yeah. more like a trade war. <laughs> you know, a trade war? Yeah. yeah. Like a trade war. Yeah, yeah. Well, it does seem like right now the threat of political interference by other nations is being used to as push agendas that aren't really justified by it. Anyway, there's, there's a, some people use the Huawei thing as an example of a supply chain attack. And this one here, yeah, this is 
This thing called the PipDig plugin for WordPress is unbelievable. This company puts malware in the plugin so they can take over your site. And this one, if you're hosted on blue something, blue code or something, it will then turn off a caching feature on the server to make your site run. You know, first, they'll send you a referral link to blue coats so they get paid when you switch to blue coats then when you do they will turn on this feature to slow down the blue coats so you're not happy and make things pop up on your screen offering you hosting with them to get you go back to them and pay them more and they have a secret part of the plugin that has a remote control of your website and can put code on your website it's just amazing stuff and they've been caught blue coat is just a web hosting service but they have a referral program so you can refer other people to them and get money and um they have a special caching service. And so there's another one here someplace about this. Yeah. No, no, no. Anyway, there's, a, there's two or three articles about this same company that made this plug-in and lied about it and put malware in it and got caught and put other malware in it. And, you know, everyone said, you've got to be nuts to trust these guys. Anyway, this is, this is another issue, like the Huawei. People say you can't trust Huawei because the Chinese government could pollute the supply chain, which they certainly could. And if you are a typical developer, you're using something like WordPress that's based on libraries that come from 100 people. Then you put in plugins that come from all over the place, and all those people have administrative control to some extent over your server. So, you know, it's not surprising that people get hacked. And when you actually try to consider how many people you're trusting, it's too many. So I didn't know it was this many. Apparently, women are now up to 20% of the cybersecurity workforce, uh, up from 11%. Um, I certainly see more women in the classes. I, it should be 50%, but anyway, it's a lot better than it used to be. Um, so that's good. Uh, this has been announced for years. They're going to block all the porn in the UK. Um, and it turns out that um, they're going to block it by default. And the only way you can get access to the porn in the UK on the internet will be to prove that you're an adult. But the government did not want to take the job of proving you're an adult, so they outsourced that to the porn company. So now everybody has to give their identity to the porn company to prove they're an adult. And now third, and since not everybody wants to give their credit card or whatever it is to the porn companies, third party companies have appeared. MindGeek is apparently the main porn company in the world. They run Pornhub, UPorn, and RedTube and the others. And they have developed a service called Age ID, where you give them, I guess, a credit card or something, and, or they, they keep track of who you are. So now they've got all your data, as if you want to trust them. Um, and then this other company has showed up uh, to give you a non- an alternative has appeared. Um, some a, some other company will, a porn pass, will come out by a company named Porties, where you can go pay a fee and go to a convenience store and buy a Porties card, which certifies you as an adult without giving your details. So this is the kind of madness. Like, you know, uh, somebody, now. Somebody wants some money. Of course. And now all these weird, sketchy companies are going to have your data. Yeah, yeah, well, it's the same issue of free speech we're fighting over here, and, you know, what you do is hard. So this is pretty amazing. So meta, um, so a bunch of, a couple more um, cryptocurrency exchanges got hacked, and it is typically madness. Um, there are so many coins people are using. There's lots and lots of, uh, of dirt about these companies. Anyway, um, yeah, here's the founder. The founder of this company changed his name legally a few times to hide from his crimes. He starts businesses, he steals the money, claims he's been hacked, starts another one, you know, which has happened over and over again. They don't really get hacked. They just steal the money and then they say somebody hacked them. Although they might be getting hacked, you can't prove that, but it certainly seems that way. So if you're getting the OSCP or this penetration testing with Kali, which maybe I should be uh, teaching, that's supposed to be the Linux course, uh, they have a nice book here to prepare you for it and so on. And penetration testing with Kali has a free online course which is um, a precursor to the OSCP. So uh, I heard about that from Zachariah, a guy I'm dealing with in Saudi Arabia, and he, I, maybe I should um, teach a class based on that. We'll see. Anyway, it certainly is an option for people. I put this in the news links to NA124 because I know a lot of students are going for this cert, and I need to get it myself pretty soon. So it's good to know about that. Um, Google has detected twice as much malware in Google Play, but that's because they changed the rules. Now they detect click fraud, um, where it clicks on things and the, um, and but the, that's a hundred percent increase, but the increase is from 0.02 percent to 0.04 percent. So that sounds like there's no malware in Google Play, which seems highly unlikely to me. But anyway, um, I sure hear about a lot of malware in Google Play. Anyway, so I think we're up to the official time here. So let's take a look at the uh, 
Other part of databases, I broke the database into two pieces um, because it's a, part, a little bit abstract for most students. If you've never run a database, then they seem very complicated. And I know businesses typically avoid databases very much. Most businesses only understand spreadsheets and their employees only understand spreadsheets and they feel like databases are just baffling and confusing and they avoid them and try to run a business on just spreadsheets for a long time. It's not that hard, but you do have to get used to thinking of data with a little bit of structure in it. Anyway, so if you're trying to hack um, with SQL injection or other attacks on databases, then you are usually trying to inject a control character, like an apostrophe or a quote, and um, people will try to block that somehow. Now, even if you remove all the quotes, that doesn't stop all SQL injection because you can inject into a numeric field, and into a numeric field, you can just inject text like or without a quote and it will have an effect. So um, here's ways, so here's a query, um, on Oracle and MS SQL, you can use this function like char 109, char 197, char 114 to spell out something without actually putting in a forbidden character. So you'll have char and then a number, so the filter that is looking for something like an apostrophe will not find it. But when the SQL server processes it, that will turn into an apostrophe, and that's one common trick to evade filters. Um, you might block the comment. Remember, the most common injection we talk about all the time is apostrophe or one equals one dash dash, because that will make this select star for users or a name equals blank or one equals one, and the dash dash will start a comment. So the rest of the line will be ignored. So one thing you might do is block dash dash in input, since there's no reason for someone to be putting a dash dash in a name and that would prevent them from feeding up a comment. This is why a better kind of injection than this that accomplishes the same thing as this, apostrophe or apostrophe A equals apostrophe A. This way, you use the apostrophes that the developer put around it at each end, so it turns into this, where name equals nothing or A equals A, to accomplish exactly the same goal of taking something that was only supposed to be true if you put in a valid name and password and turns into something that's always true, but you do not need to inject any comment field. So uh, that's probably, this should probably be the standard thing people inject instead of that thing with a dash dash. Anyway, uh, sometimes they block select, but sometimes all they do is one grep for select. So they have one pass where they remove the word select everywhere. So if that's the case, you can just put select in the middle of another select and the grep will remove the one in the middle and leave the second one. Um, you can also change the case because they might be using a case sensitive search you can put a null byte before it, which might break the comparison code, but not the SQL code using it. Um, you can spell it out and encode it in various ways, hoping that their um, filtering will happen before the decoding. Those are all attempts to catch common mistakes. Some people prevent you from putting in spaces. So if they do, you don't really need spaces. You can put comments in the middle to separate items, comments and, and commas. Um, and MySQL even allows you to put comments in the middle of keywords, so this will also stop filters that are looking for things like select. Um, now this is a cute one, second order SQL injection. Well, a lot of people want to let you put an apostrophe in your name, because a lot of names really have apostrophes in them. So maybe you would like to allow that. If you do, the correct thing to do is if someone puts in a name with an apostrophe, you should turn it into two apostrophes. This is the right way to do it. So someone puts in foo apostrophe, you insert foo double apostrophe. Yeah, that is the standard convention. What this will do, what SQL will do when it sees this, it will insert foo with one apostrophe into the database. So you can now have a name stored in the database with an apostrophe. The problem is, even though you handled this correctly, your other code that uses the data from the database might not remember to, to consider this. So you might be able to poison the database so the SQL injection happens later when that name is used. This is... um like persistent cross-site scripting. There's two kinds of cross-site scripting. There's one where you bounce data off a server and it affects one user, and the other is where you store something with code in it, like in a Facebook post that many people will see over and over. And this is the same thing. I've now stored a name in the database that has an apostrophe. So later on, when it's used for something else, it will, be, it will cause an error. When it's used for listing out all the users or changing a password or some other activity, you know, if you're going to allow apostrophes in a database, you have to make sure that every use of the database is aware that you're letting that happen. Um, when it reads it back, the code that reads it back will find an apostrophe, and so the next code that compares username to something might crash and put out an error. Yes, yes. 
Yeah, you'll have to watch for it every time you use it after that. That's the whole problem with these control characters. You really ought to be using data structures instead. So here's an exploit. Register a new user with the name with the apostrophes in it. Now perform a password change, and MS SQL will return this error, saying you have a syntax error, and the syntax error will tell you what value it failed at, and this is the administrator password. Because you confused it so much that it interpreted the stored password as the command that was being broken. That's the point. You've confused it, and now you get error messages that pump out the secrets. Um, all right. So uh, now this is, by the way, the kind you see in CTS, but you don't see it that commonly in the real world, is a query that prints on the screen directly what came from the database. This is a nice, simple case, but usually it's not that simple. Usually, if you put in something like username and password, it doesn't echo something it got from the table directly from that. It just accepts you to log in, sends you something like a session cookie, takes you to something like a profile page or a shopping page, which probably doesn't include directly anything that came from that query. So if you're breaking the query, all you, you will not really see any results. And if you want to steal data, like credit card numbers or something, you won't see them because there isn't any field on the page that came straight from the database you can put them in. That's blind SQL injection, and it's by far the most common arrangement. So um, you can try to add a union and then create an error message. That's one way to get around it. Um, one way to, you have to, this is a very common problem. Um, and I found it when I did a, a series of online hacking uh, training products I did a couple of years ago. Um, I would hack into a server, and all I would get is a 500 error, some kind of error on the server when you inject stuff, and the injection is working. You don't see any of the results. So now you have the problem of exfiltration. This is a general problem when you hack. You hack a server, you gain some control over it, you gain some, some access to the data you need, now you have to somehow get the data out of their system to you. And rarely is there an obvious, easy way to do that. So here are ways to try to exfiltrate data. Now, one thing you could do, of course, is just shut down the database. That's something you might do for various purposes. The main use of this is extortion. You take down people's server and you charge money to bring it back up. Um, but if you want to retrieve data, um, if you're trying to, if you don't only have numerical fields that are coming out, like prices, you can't put letters in that field. They won't appear on the screen, but you can use commands that change the numbers, the letters to numbers, like ASCII or substring. So here's substring of admin 11. This will give you an A, the first letter in the word admin. So this will return 65. You do ASCII. So this is a way to change one letter into a number. So now you could use injections like that to pump out numbers that will spell something out. And I've had to do this when uh, making key loggers for Android apps quite a few times. All right, so here's the one I was talking about. If you have blind SQL injection, where you can inject just a uh, SQL command and have it executed because you can't see the results, you can sometimes use a network connection to leak it out. Um, for example, this will let you make a connection out in old versions of MS SQL. You can connect to your remote server, like mdattacker.net on port 80, so you can now send queries out from SQL. And as you saw in the uh, last time, you can write files inside SQL. Oracle lets you make an HTTP request inside here, and so you can just start a listener, and requests will come to you, and you can now make requests that include the data. What is normally done by malware is, of course, DNS requests. This is the most common way um, a data is exfiltrated from bots, and you can do it inside databases. So this will um, select password for username is sys, and then go to md. This will get host name. So it will attempt to resolve this URL, and this URL will include some secrets. It will now try to steal the password for the sys, the administrator account, and then do that password.mdattacker.net. So there will be a DNS query going to them that includes the database, includes the secret. And this is what you see. In fact, one common um, clue that you've been infected with malware is you get a lot of DNS requests, and they are for stupid things like this, long random series of characters, because there's encoded data sneaking out in those URLs. A pipe? Uh, yes, that's a pipe. Yeah, the two vertical lines. Yeah. And I think that's, um, that's just concatenating strings. All right. Then there's MySQL. We've done this already. You select and out file. We did it to make a PHP shell on the server. But you can write a file any place where you have write privileges. So you can select data, and then you can put it in an out file. And so you can put it in some kind of shared, if you can find a file share, 
that you can access. You could write it into the shared folder and then download the file. That's one way to sneak data out. Um, all right. Uh, the operating system will sometimes let you execute server commands. Now, you know you can do it with a PHP shell. If you can write someplace, write a PHP file. Sometimes you can just do direct shell commands right from inside SQL. Um, then you could use things like TFTP and Telnet to make connections outside. Um, all right. So I got a few cahoots about that stuff. And they are here. This one. Good. Well, this reminds me, I might as well bring this up while it's here. Um, I meant to show this to you guys. Um, so Caitlin and somebody hacked the attack server. So now it looks like this. So I have very little clue what this is all about. Some kind of, obviously some form of Japanese animation. Well, anyway, I thought, you know, I told them it would be pretty easy to get root on the attack server, and it is. You can do it, too. You can get a shell on the attack server in quite a few of the homeworks, and then you just have to do privilege escalation and become root, and you can totally trash this thing. So, anyway, um, I'll probably fix it after a while, but I'll leave this up at least for April Fool's Day. Clearly, it should be up there. So, anyway, um, I'm not sure if he gets extra credit. I'm still thinking that, because this one's too easy. Now, if you did this to my main site, you'd definitely get extra credit because that is actually updated, and it's not supposed to have privilege escalations, or shells for that matter. But anyway, that's cool. Uh, one of these crazy things where it uses JavaScript to drop glitter all over the place. Boy, I've been, I've been using some like um, PHP and Python tutorials, and a bunch of them have this. You're trying to copy stuff, and it's putting this garbage all over the screen. This is like GeoCities from 97, this kind of thing. Yeah, of course, but there are real tutorials that still do this garbage, and it's just in the way. Anyway, so anyway, that's a good thing to do for April Fool's Day anyway. All right, so I guess enough people have probably joined. I'll give it five more seconds, and then we'll go ahead with this. All right. Well, you get extra credit for hacking me in general. It's a good thing to do. All right, so if you block comment signals, what can you do anyway? Okay, that one there accomplishes the same thing of making the rest of the line irrelevant without having to eject a comment signal. That's what's good about it. All right, which one will expose a secret in an error message? All right, that one there will provoke an error because it looks for one in a word. It gets the administrator password and then looks for one in it, and that will create an error. That is trying to compare a numerical field to a string field, and the error might well include. Cannot find a number in here. That'd be a way to leak it out. All right. Which one will bypass keyword filters? The 
Okay, that's this one. If you remove select, you've got select left over. All right, this is the famous cartoon. A mother named her child this. What kind of sequel injection is she performing if she does that? Gives her student a name containing apostrophes. Okay, that's second order injection. That name will be in the database and have some effect later. At least I thought so when I wrote this question. Anyway, all right. Um, now I'm having some sympathy for that answer, but I'm sticking with this one for the moment. Um, all right. <coughs> so, Caitlin, M, Stan, looks like a real name too. Good. All right. So let's carry on here. Um, all right. So well, I mentioned this before, blind SQL injection. So suppose you do a query and the query accepts data from you and you are able to inject something like an apostrophe and run code, but you cannot see the answer. Now you've got to find some way to tell what's happening. And if you can't figure out how to use an out of band channel by making some kind of network traffic come off there, you can still do blind SQL injection by just looking for any kind of change in the behavior. So here I'm trying to look for something where a person is named Marcus and password is secret. If I put in this for the username, then I'd be logged in as administrator if it worked. Now that might happen. Um, so if, if that happens, and I realize that I'm now logged in as the administrator, I can now start asking more questions. So this will log in as administrator and this one will not log in. So if I believe my injection is working, then I can now ask a yes or no question. This one will log in, this one will not log in because the condition is false. So this is the game of 20 questions. I can now ask a yes or no question every time I query. So here's one that will log in and that one will not log in. Um, this is looking for one letter in one word. It's looking for the first letter and see does it equal 65, which is a capital A, or does it equal 66, which is a capital B. So the first condition is true and the next one is false. So now with enough true or false questions, you can find out something. You could spell out a password letter by letter and query it one by one. And after hundreds of queries, you could find out the administrator password with this kind of thing. Um, all right, you can induce conditional errors. Here's another one. You can select one over zero, which is going to give an error, division by zero, from a database where some condition is here. And if the condition is true, it will then do this. But if the condition is not true, it will never try to evaluate one over zero. So now you'll get an error message in one case, and you won't get an error message in the other case. And it has the same effect, that you're now able to ask one true or false question. Um, all right. And so here's one. Does this user exist? So you select one over zero, um, where you select username with the username with that name. And if that username exists, you will not get an error. And if it does exist, you will get an error as it attempts to divide by zero. So that's the kind of trick. And there's the uh, time delays that I think I showed you before, where you can make a query that will cause a wait. MS SQL has a wait for command. You can also use the ping command like we did before, ping 127.001 a few times to make a delay. Um, there's various ways to do it. So now you can ask for a question, and depending on whether it's true or false, you'll either get a delay or you won't. So that's another way to pump out data. You can use a bitwise hand operator and the power command to query bits one by one. If you don't want to query characters one by one, you can use these to calculate one bit in a character and then see if it's a one or a zero and what gradually pump. Power? What's that? Was it power? Uh, calculates the number, two to the power one, two to the power two. You could just as well type in two or four, really. Against, uh, characters, uh, yeah, yeah. So this was instead, before we took one letter and compared it to a number. So we might have to try maybe a uh, hundred guesses to find out what letter it was. Here we're going to get the first bit in the letter, in the first letter, and see if it's one or zero. So it'll only take eight queries to find out the entire bunch. That's it'll all amounts to about the same thing. All right. Now there's a sleep function in MySQL. That's another option. You can sleep for five seconds if something is true. So again, you'll see based on how long it takes to reply. Um, Oracle doesn't have a function to cause a delay, but you can use URL HTTP to try to go to a non-existent server and it will now time out. And time out will take some period of time and therefore mm -hmm. if it attempts to do that, it'll be slower than if it doesn't attempt to do that. And again, you can construct something that lets you ask a yes or no question. All right, 
So here's one. If this, if you can select your username from all users, your username equals dbsnmp, then it will do this request and that will go to the server that's not there and take a long time. If that user doesn't exist, it will not attempt to do the request and answer quickly. Uh, this, by the way, applies not only to SQL injection, but encryption routines. It's one of the most difficult things about encryption. Almost all encryption routines take a different amount of time to run, depending on what the data and the key are. And that means you can deduce information about the key by sending many requests. And that's why people, uh, it is a big problem. Time channels are often a side channel. Anyway, then you can do other things beyond SQL injection. SQL injection lets you go in the database but you might be able to access the data used by other parts of the operating system. Uh, there are some attacks where you write to a file and then execute that file to get command injection. Um, you can then pivot and take over other machines. Um, you can make network connections back to your machine from the database. And then you can sometimes make user-defined functions in the database, which is essentially what we did by putting up a PHP cell. Um, you can sometimes adjust the database to add the missing features. If you get database administrator, you can change the database parameters to turn on the old obsolete features that have been uh, deprecated for security. MS SQL used to have this thing called XP command shell, which is just a hacker's dream. You can just get a DOS command shell right there in the database. They took it away because it was insanely dangerous, but you could do things like this just to execute commands right in there. So if you can find a way to turn this back on or find a really old database, that's just asking for it. Yeah. If the database is running root, you can add, you can put in the, the DLL or the screwed object file for the payload, use out file to write the function that you want to run, and add input database uh, directory. Yeah. So you can essentially do the same thing, you know, do an extra step. Yep, that's right. Um, I think you can do all these things in Oracle. That was why this was such a big deal when they started publishing this about six years ago at DEF CON. They actually had the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, and everybody coming down to DEF CON trying to make people shut up because everybody uses Oracle, all the government insurance companies and everybody, and they all thought Oracle was safe. And in fact, Oracle has all these same problems. It just wasn't as widely known. And people really freaked out when they started publishing how to hack Oracle. And it turns out you can do pretty much all this stuff in Oracle. Yeah, that's the point. Yep, that's right. But you can often get the administrator password just like you can in the others with injections of the same type. So it's not actually any better. There was a wide belief that Oracle was much safer until about six years ago, and then everybody learned how to hack Oracle. It's the same reason why people thought Linux was more secure than Windows. Um, it's just, there's time, and the same reason why people thought they could commit crimes with Bitcoin. There's a period of time when the authorities don't understand it yet. And then you can do stuff and you think you're getting away with it because they haven't learned it. But then they learn, and then it turns out to be not fundamentally different than all the other systems. Um, that's why a lot of people like to jump on the newest thing and feel like they're secure. And for a brief period of time, of course, you are secure because nobody understands it. But you're not really secure unless it's actually a better product. Anyway, um, you can also write to the registry, which is pretty awesome. That gives you complete control of the machine. That's how the UFO hacker, Gary McKinnon, hacked into the NSA and wandered for two years through the NSA's internal network with remote registry. If you can write to the registry, you can do command injection on Windows. You can really do anything you want. Um, all right, so ever since 2005, um, XP command shell has been disabled because it was too insanely dangerous, but all you have to do is execute an advanced option to turn it back on. If you have database administrator, you can just turn it back on. And this is, in fact, how almost all malware works. We're going to do the malware analysis class again next semester. And Microsoft Windows has a lot of advanced features to prevent exploits now. It has um, address space layout randomization, and it has uh, a premise called re write or execute. So no part of memory can be both writable and executable. So you cannot modify any of the code. But those are just software features, and you can just call the system routine to turn them off and then you're in. This is why another attack that is very common is you get infected with malware, and what the malware does is disable your antivirus. Because it's just a process running in memory, you can just turn it off, and this happens all the time. So, you know, it's uh, that's the problem. There's got to be some way to turn it off, and therefore, it's really not that hard for your attack to turn it off. All right, so, so MySQL has load file to read a file, so you can read data and print it out on the screen or put it someplace. And um, you can also write files, select into an out file, so you can now write to a file and you can read from a file. 
and you've done that in the projects. Um, there are tools to make this automatic. In the projects, you did manual SQL injection where you're putting in long lines of data that you're either typing in or copying from a library, and there are tools that basically just have a library and paste it in for you. So here's the general algorithm. You brute force all the parameters, try injecting apostrophes and other things into every parameter everywhere. This is one of the things that really freaks out database and server administrators when you run um, phone scanners. I just got an email from the people I'm gonna teach in, in Texas saying they, they want me to teach my class and a bunch of students wanna take it, but they wanna put me in this tiny room that only has 15 seats because last year they had an ethical hacking teacher who ran Nessus phone scans on the network and set off all the alarms and freaked out everybody. So they made a special isolated room that they want to put me in. They said, are you going to do that? I said, no, actually I did that here about 10 years ago. Student brought in Acunetrics, he ran it to scan things. Never do that, holy crap. I learned the same thing that guy learned. If you run a phone scanner, it floods everybody with error messages, thousands of error messages, because it finds every place it can put in anything, every parameter, every field, everywhere, and it tries like 100 injections in every one. So you get like, what happened here is they got 10,000 emails in the administrator's inbox in like an hour of, of errors and problems that they tried to sign up for something. So, you know, the first thing it does is brute force every parameter. And you should be doing this in an isolated virtual copy of the real server, not on a real production network. It's a fundamental error. Anyway, um, then after you've found these uh, append various characters, try to do a union attack and now try to um, append various columns to see how many columns you have and what they are. Then you try to receive data. Then you try injecting Boolean conditions. And then you try time delays. These are the kind of things you do. And there are automated tools that will try all these things. Essentially what bone scanners do. SQL map is a common tool used by hackers. Um, the command line string can be kind of annoying, but when you get it right, it will automatically do the attack and dump out the data. I've got some projects where you use SQL map and uh, um, it's considered a little cooler than using Havij. Havij is the uh, automatic tool where you don't even have to know what you're doing. You just type in the URL, hit go, and it goes. And it'll only work on the simpler kinds of injection, but there are a lot of these hacking tools. That will, all they're doing is exactly the same thing you're doing in an automated fashion. So um, SQL map has more options than Hobby. Yes, I think if you're skillful, you can accomplish more with SQL map, but it's more complicated. Yeah. It's considered a more professional tool. And phone scanners are usually quite simple. Phone scanners only try like the simplest thing. They often miss vulnerabilities. In most, in my experiments and other people have reported the same thing, phone scanners only find about half of the vulnerabilities they're supposed to. They're really not very good at all. But they do find some things, and the main thing about them is they will try every parameter on every page, which you probably don't have the patience to do. So they are part of a good pen test, but they're not a whole pen test at all. Because they miss problems, and they also lie to you and tell you things are wrong when they're not wrong. So you have to go through and manually test whatever the bone scanner finds. And like I say, be aware that when you run a bone scanner, you will freak out everybody on the network. It will cause huge problems. You shouldn't just casually do it to a production network. I'll wait a few more seconds. All right, I guess that's it. So which method gives you one yes or no question per query? Okay, that's conditional errors. All right. Which one exposes data from local files? In PHP, they call this local file inclusion. I don't seem to like using that term for SQL, but it seems to be like a fair term. That's load file. All right. And which one lets you inject commands on Windows? Yep, the old XB command chip. And which one creates a local file? 
Yep, select something into out file. That's how you made your PHP shell. All right. So I got Caitlin twice and M node twice and AE. I remember that. Good. All right. So, um, all right. We got a little more of this. So then, of course, how to prevent it. And every chapter you got at the end, which just kind of summarizes everything. So the simplest thing you do is block apostrophes. This is not a perfect solution, but it will stop the most common kind of SQL injection. So if you do nothing else, this is a good thing to do. Now, um, this will not stop you from injecting into numerical fields. If I have a number, I can just, and the number should be one, I can just inject one space or A equals A, or one or two equals two, and I can turn it into something true. So I can inject stuff right into a numerical field without apostrophes. So you might still have very simple SQL injection vulnerabilities, even if you block apostrophes, but it will stop the most common um, vulnerability, and it'll probably stop simple attack tools like Havij. Um, if you allow apostrophes in by doubling them, instead of blocking apostrophes, then you may have opened up second order rejection. So that's another issue. Stored <coughs> procedures are much better. So you define a procedure, like register user Joe in secret. Now, if you do this, a stored procedure can still let you inject things if you have apostrophes in, because you'll still have an apostrophe, you'll still have apostrophes in the database here. Um, but parameterized queries are what stops you. The stored procedure does not necessarily stop SQL injection, but parameterized queries do because you define a data object which cannot be misinterpreted as a code object. The fundamental problem here is it reads through a line of code and it tries to find an apostrophe and match it with the next apostrophe to decide what part of this is data and what part of this is commands. And that is fundamentally stupid because you do not need to go through that operation here. To do it right, you make a parameterized query. So you um, define um, a, a data object. And this is vulnerable code. Here's the vulnerable code where I define the query structure, select ename from, or ename equals quote. Then I put in the data that came from the user, and then I actually get the query. And this is the fundamental problem. I create a line of text, which is then parsed. Here's the parameterized version. Um, here, I define ename equals question mark, and then down here, I create a prepared statement for query text, and now I set the parameter equal to the name. So I define that this area is a parameter, and then I fill in the parameter from the user, but it is not read as a line of text to be parsed. The structure of the text is defined up here, where it contains all the commands, and that question mark says whatever there is just data, and this just fills it in for the data. That is the correct way to do it. That's a parameterized query, where you tell the computer explicitly what part of this is data and what part of it is code, and it doesn't matter what characters are in the name. Now you can have apostrophes or anything in your name and it's not gonna matter because it goes into a place where the computer knows is only for data. That's the right thing to do, and it takes um, maybe seven lines of code instead of three to do, and it really should be what everybody does. I don't know why they do anything else. It's a shame, but uh, they do, and that gives us small business. Yeah? Well, well actually, underneath it is just um, whatever you the user put in, yes. Try to set it as a, as a yeah, the user can put in anything, and it will just be interpreted as the data that goes there. So whatever you type, it'll just look for that matching in the database. So underneath it, it just, the user data just um, it as a string. Yeah, the user data is just interpreted as a string, and there are no characters that can be added to the user data that will be interpreted as anything other than a string. That's all it is. So now you could have apostrophes, null bytes, anything in the name, and it would just be a character in the name. It would just see if it matches the stored data. That's all. That's obviously what you should be doing anyway. So here's the game. You have to always use parameterized queries for everything. Um, every item data should be changed and so on. If the user can change column names, that would be dangerous. So you should not let them type in a column name. You should force them to uh, just choose from a list of known good names. And unfortunately, you can't use it for other things like sort by. So um, the structure of the language does not allow you to parameterize all the places where user data might go, and that's a weakness. But correctly implemented parameterized queries are essentially involved. Anyway, um, you, for defense in depth, because you cannot trust any measure to really work, because for example, people always make mistakes. So you should run your application with low privileges, not as root. You should turn off the unnecessary features in the database that you're not using. Put on vendor patches, you know, the usual thing. Um, have some kind of regular update process so you patch the known vulnerabilities. 
And then, of course, NoSQL databases. These things became popular about eight years ago. And then I think they peaked about three years ago and fell down again. For a while, everybody thought there was going to be these new things called NoSQL databases. Facebook, I think, is one of the big things that started it. The original databases were designed for financial works, the stuff I used to do. If you were at a bank or something, you have a database that has all everybody's account balance. And if somebody writes a check and spends some of their money, you subtract some money from their balance, and that's it. The balance has to be exactly right all the time. And if you have another copy of the database somewhere else, it all has to be updated right away. But if you have something like Facebook, somebody puts a, a statement or a picture on their wall, you don't really need every person to instantly see that. You could have another kind of database that is less deterministic, where the data just sort of is set around like email, where it starts sending messages out to all the other people's Facebook servers, so that eventually they'll get it, but they don't all have to get it right away. This means whenever anybody pulls up a wall, looks up on Facebook wall, it doesn't have to go all the way to the main server and get a perfect copy of the wall. It can use a local copy, which has got data just sort of bubbling over. It will eventually get there. And the idea, of, that's what a NoSQL database does. It's not 100% accurate. It eventually lines up, but it takes time. And the, originally, people thought this was going to save a lot of time and a lot of money to make this kind of less strict database. And it became all over the place. So you can have all kinds of data in here. And um, people thought it would be awesome. You can look up things. Anyway, it turned out people, everyone jumped on these things like Cassandra, and then they all got kind of disillusioned with them a few years later. It didn't turn out to be the miraculous solution for everything. Uh, blockchains are doing the same thing. Everybody thought blockchains were going to save the world. Now, since the crash, they're all kind of getting fed up with them. Anyway, so you can do things with various kinds of queries here. And um, so here's MongoDB. Um, here's login code. Looks like this. Return the username. This password equals password. Um, so return this, where the username equals the username for the user, and the password equals password for the user. And if this happens, then you set the logged in variable equal to one. It's accepted who you are. Um, so you can inject into NoSQL databases. It has the same problem. You can inject again with apostrophes. And what will happen is that makes username equal Marcus, and the slash slash starts a comment, so it ignores the rest. This is the Mongo equivalent of apostrophe or one equals one dash dash that has the same effect. Because this has the same, even though the underlying database structure is different, the fundamental logic of this statement is the same. You're reading this statement and trying to match the apostrophes to figure out what's going on. Um, here's another one. You can log in with this username and any password. This is the equivalent of the one that doesn't need the comment signal. So um, JavaScript will interpret it like this. This is username equals A, or one equals one, or A equals A. And so that'll do it. This will let you in with any name and any password. Um, because that combined command is always true. Um, here's XPath. XPath is an XML type database. So here I've got addresses for Bill Gates, Chris Dawes, and James Hunter, and I've got passwords and credit card numbers stored in the database here with XML. This is how a lot of data is stored these days. And XPath is the query to query that. So you do something like this, address email. This will retrieve all the email addresses. And uh, it'll go in the address database, find the emails, and then print out the text it finds there. So here's the query to find the information the user does. You put a command at the end, text equals does. This is the conditional that tells me which, which record to get. So you can inject it. You could, um, this will retrieve extorted credit card number from username and password, because at the end I have text equals does and password equals secret, then give me the credit card text. This is the equivalent of select star from DB where a name equals expected name and password equals expected password. This injection that looks very familiar to us will have the same result. Now the password text equals nothing or A equals A. So again, now I'll get in with any password. Um, so it works. So it, just like a MySQL, the other thing you talk about, apostrophes will often break it. Uh, these will often change behavior without breaking syntax because they balance out the numbers of apostrophes. And uh, so if you want to prevent these things, remove all the control characters, the same as SQL. Um, that's one way to go. LDAP is what's used to store databases um, for logging in. And Microsoft Active Directory uses LDAP. It's a very common data storage technique. Um, and it turns out LDAP queries look different. They are used parentheses, and that's how you match a username. And if you want to match several conditions, 
the and or or is right at the start, which is going to turn out to make this much more secure. Probably not, it was probably not designed with any more brilliance, but it just happens to be structured in a way that makes it hard to get away with injection because you have to start with the command here. So this will make any of these, this is or, so or, this condition, that condition, or that condition. If any one of them is true, it's true. This is and, so both of these conditions have to be true for it to be true. Um, those are how it works. So this means you can, in principle, exploit it, but in practice, you can't get much done because you can't add any logical operators. You can't add an or or an and. And remember, all the injections that are fun involve like or one equals one. If you can't put the and or the or in, then you really can't do much. So in principle, it's vulnerable. In practice, it's not very exploitable. And this is what I've been saying about bone scanners. Bone scanners will often tell you this is a red letter bone, but when you look at it, it doesn't really go anywhere. It's like you have an unlocked door, but what's in there is nothing important. So it's not really a problem worth telling anybody about and fixing. It's just detected as a defect by a stupid scanner that doesn't go any further than just checking to see if the door is open. All right. I think they got these cahoots, and that's the end of this. Let me get rid of this one. All right. Yeah. For what? Yeah, yeah. If you're not in that class, um, yeah, it's worth, even if you are, yeah, that's where the extra credit comes out on Wednesday. Yeah. Good. Remind me to take a list when we get there. I should. Yeah. Guest speakers are always worth extra credit. Yeah. And I, I expect I'll be able to simulcast it, but I'm not sure. I think they'll go for that. He's doing it remotely from somewhere like Florida or something. But I had I found a B-sides talk from him and it looked very good. So I think it'll be a very good talk. No way. All right. There are probably jokes I'm not getting here. Mm -hmm. Ten people. There are ten people. Okay. All right. I'll wait a few more seconds. Looks like we got everybody that's coming. Okay. All right. So what's the best defense? That's it. Parameterized queries are where you specify what part of it is data and it cannot be misunderstood as code. That's essentially foolproof. All right. Which defense might open second order in vulnerabilities? Yep, double apostrophes, as we saw. All right, which of these is least susceptible to injection? LDAP, because you cannot inject a logical command. So even though you can inject things, you can't inject anything that does much harm. All right, and what system uses queries that look like that? Just slashes. That was XPath, that XML-based system. All right, which system looks like that? The and and then conditions in parentheses. That's LDAP with the logical operator right at the start before any user data. All right, so I got Caitlin three times and Stan twice. And no way, we'll have to tell me who they are. No way in the room? Ah, good, okay, good. All right, uh, I'll get that name later. All right, so I got the people. Um, so I'm just gonna go up to the lab and see if anybody needs help in anything. Um, and uh, tomorrow we'll have cryptography class as usual. On Wednesday we have this guest speaker, Neil Desai. I'm hoping I can live stream it, but the people who come to this room will get in for sure. I don't know if he'll want to go for that. Anyway, I'll just stop the share. Any questions coming in from you guys online? I'll wait a few seconds.
Apparently not. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and go upstairs.